Today's case began on January 2, 1935, at 1.20 p.m., when a 25-old-looking young man named Roland Owen was admitted to the President Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri, United States. He was alone, and although he was wearing a well-tailored suit, he had no suitcase or backpack with him, just a black coat, a comb, and a toothbrush in his hands. His face had distinguishable features, such as slightly deformed ears, like those of boxers, and a scar on the left side of his head. Roland requested a room without a view of the street and on the highest floors of the hotel. Under these conditions, one was available, room 1046, on the 10th floor. No one took into account the man's peculiar manner, as the hotel was already well known for hosting business travelers looking for a nightly company. The next day, January 3rd, around noon, the maid Mary Sopke appeared in the room to do the daily cleaning and the door was half open. Upon entering, she saw Roland sitting on the edge of the maid bed. She didn't know if he had already organized everything or if he had just slept on the top of the sheets and woken up. The curtains were closed and only one lamp was on. As Mary cleaned, Roland continued to sit on the bed, but he warned her to leave the door unlocked because he had a friend who was coming to visit him the afternoon. At 4 p.m., Mary returned, but this time to change towels. Once again, the door was unlocked and Roland was still in bed, but this time he was asleep on the maid bed and dressed from head to toe. During the exchange, Mary saw a paper on the nightstand that said, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes, wait for me. She assumed that the main stay in the room was this Don, and the one who had left the note was the friend he was expecting to visit. On the 4th, at 10.30 a.m., returning to do her daily work, Mary found the door locked and imagining Roland had finally left. But when she opened it, she saw the same man from the day before, sitting on the chair in the corner of the completely dark room. She decided not to say anything and just started cleaning so she could get out of there as soon as possible. While she was cleaning, the phone rang and on the phone Roland said just four things. Hello? No thanks, I already had my breakfast. No don't. Please, I'm not hungry. And, okay, thanks. Mary found it strange for the guest to speak to someone named Dawn, as the day before she had seen a note for someone with the same name. She had assumed that the note was made by that friend of the guest, but when she heard him talking to Dawn on the phone, she couldn't understand any of it. Why would the guest leave a note for someone, notifying him that he wouldn't return in 15 minutes if he was already in the room sleeping. The situation was getting more and more awkward. A few minutes later, Roland started talking to Mary, asking all sorts of probing questions, like how much money the maids make, how many rooms do they clean in one day, if could guests live long term in the hotel, he also complained about the prices of older hotels in the region. She answered the questions, even though she found it all weird. On the way out, she noticed the door had been locked from the outside. That is, someone had locked the guest inside the room. During the afternoon, when the towels were to be changed again, she knocked on the door to inform Roland that she was going in Someone else with a strange voice answered, We don't need towels now. Come back later. During the night, around 11 p.m., a taxi driver named Robert Lane saw a man walking down the street wearing only pants and a very thin t-shirt, despite the cold that night. This man was the guest in room 1046. Upon entering the car, the driver noticed that Roland was bleeding on his arm, in addition to having many bruises on his body. 
during the journey. The only thing Roland said was, I will get this over tomorrow. During the dawn, two things happened. Guest Jean Owen, who is staying in 1048, the room next to the door, heard a waste voice in room 1046, as well as crying that sounded like a woman's. She thought about calling the reception, but decided not to, because the crying didn't last long. On the same floor, a call girl who was meeting a client in apartment 1026 heard the noise of things being dropped inside room 1046, as well as some moans of pain, sounds as if someone was struggling, and after that, absolute silence. At 8.30 a.m., the hotel reception received a call from the telephone operator informing them that the telephone in 1046 had been off the hook for quite a long time. Remembering, guys, this happened in 1935 and the telephone system at the time was not the same as it's today. There were telephone exchanges that monitored the lines, received calls from users, and then the operator connected them to the desired destinations. So, an employee went into the room to warn Roland about the phone. Although the doorknob carried a do not disturb sign, he knocked on the door. Roland answered with a very weak voice. Come in. Come in. The employee tried to open the door, but it was locked. So, he just said behind the door, Sir, your phone is off hook. Could you put it back on, please? Roland didn't answer. Sir? Sir? Just put the phone back on the hook. Thanks. Almost two hours later, the phone company called again and said the phone was still off the hook. The hotel decided to send another employee, this time with a master key. When the employee into the room, the setting looked like a horror movie. There was blood all over the floor, all over the wall, and all over the ceiling. Roland was in the bathroom, unclothed, on his knees. He was critically injured, with his head resting against the side of the tub. But he was still alive. Desperate, the employee called the police, who arrived at the hotel in a few minutes. When they asked Roland who has done this to him, he said, nobody, I just fell here, in the bathroom. Roland died on his way to the hospital. The autopsy reports that he was tortured for a few hours. On the left side of the head were marks that looked like repeated blows. The arms, legs and neck had been tied by some kind of a rope. Stubby wounds pierced one of the lungs and the skull was fractured. The hotel did not record the entry of visitors, and because of this, it was not possible to identify who could have been responsible for this crime. For the police, nothing made sense. The only things they found were a fingerprint on the phone, which in the end could not be identified, as well as hair clip, a cigarette butt, a tie, a broken glass, a trash bucket that had been used to burn papers, and in the bathroom, a bottle of diluted sulfuric acid. In the course of investigations, it was discovered that the name Roland Owen did not exist. As the case became known, with the guest's photo stamped in all the newspapers, several people claimed to have found him days or weeks before the crime, however, on each occasion, the guest presented himself with a different name. A hotel located on the semi-block as the President Hotel claimed to the police that a man like the one in the photo had stayed there for one night on January 1st under the name Eugene Scott. But there's only one problem. No local with that name existed either. Without any information that would unreveal the crime or at least identify the guest in room 1046, the police finally decided that the body should be buried in a grave as a pauper. 
This was announced in the newspapers, and the next day, a delivery man left a bouquet of roses in the local newspapers that was handed into the police. With it was a handwriting note that said the flowers should be placed next to the casket, as well as a cash sum of $200 for funeral expenses. Today, this would be worth about $4,000. Whoever wrote the note wrote that the deceased's name was David Brzezinski, signing the note with the words, Eternal Love, Louise. The police were unable to discover the origin of the donation, nor who this Louise was. In a search of information about David Brzezinski, the police found only one citizen in Salt Lake City, but he died in a railway accident 15 years earlier. They also didn't find out who Don was or the identity of anyone else who visited the guest in room 1046. With no more information to go off of, the case was dropped. In 1936, a woman from Alabama who identified herself as Eleanor Ogletree contacted the police saying that she thinks this guy named Roland is her brother, but actually it's not his real name. He's called Artemus Ogletree. He was missing since April 34 because her mother and she were getting typewriting letters from Artemus saying that he was working in another state and was planning to visit Europe, but it was when the last information came and he never got in touch again. A few days later, someone else called. A man who says his name was Jordan said Roland actually is called Artemus and he had met him in Egypt. He also said Artemus saved his life in Cairo in 1930 and he had a picture with him in the pyramids. Jordan promised to send the pictures to the police. In the photos, the resemblance between him and the guest is striking, but Jordan never got in touch again and the police weren't able to return the call. For years to come, authorities continued to look for clues, but nothing more was discovered. Now we are going to take a leap of particularly three generations. In 2003, nearly 17 years later, John Horner, a Kansas librarian who had written a story about the case three years earlier, got a call from a builder saying that he was working in a house where he found a box in the attic with things that maybe could be interesting to him. Inside the box was a pile of information, clippings, photographs and publishing articles about the mystery of a room 1046 which had been put together over the years, painstakingly organized in a very professional manner. The box included photos of the crime scene and the autopsy. This caught the attention of John, who had never seen such complete material on the mystery. He concluded that the owner was likely a police officer who continued to research the case for years to come. In addition to all this material, a theory about the case had been written in a typewritten letter with impeccable grammar. The document relates a possible romance between the guest of room 1046 and a girl named Louise, the one who sent the note and money to help with the funeral. This Louise would have been the wife of some criminal, politician or influential businessman who had found the victim and had him tortured in front of his mistress. Is this just a theory? with so many details still up in the air. Who was Don? Who was Jordan? Whose were the voices of the man and woman in room 1046? Whose fingerprint was found on the phone? Why did he always introduce himself with different names? In the end, despite the victim apparently being identified as Artemus, the mystery surrounding the whole case remains unsolved and unexplained to this day.